Hi, everyone. Welcome to the July 10th edition of the Timeform U.S. PaceCast. I'm David Aragon, and I'll be joined in just a second by my co-host, Craig Milkowski. This week on the podcast, we're going to take a look back at the Stars and Stripes Festival from last week in a Belmont Park. A ton of major stakes races will run there last weekend, including the Belmont Oaks and Belmont Derby, as well as the Grade 2 Suburban and the John A. Nehrud. So we'll take a look at all of those races from Saturday and some other uh, days during the week. They also ran some stakes races on Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at Belmont Park. Uh, then we'll move on to Delaware Park, where they had uh, the Delaware Oaks card and some undercard stakes races that we'll uh, talk about, and as well as a couple of races from around the country, including uh, one race from Parks and one from Los Alamitos uh, to wrap up the show. So uh, I'll welcome my co-host, Craig Mulkowski. Uh, Craig, how are you doing this week? Uh, doing well. Uh, looking forward to doing the show a day later, you know, so I've been chomping at the bit for that extra 24 hours. So excited to get going. Yeah, I was uh, moving up to Saratoga on Monday, so I just was using yesterday to kind of get uh, my bearings and get things uh, in order and catch up a little bit on work. So uh, we're recording one day later than usual. Uh, we'll start with the Belmont Park Stars and Stripes card with those Saturday stakes races. And while it's only a grade two race these days, I think the feature race in terms of you know, quality perspective uh, from the Saturday card was the Suburban, uh, run over a mile and a quarter on the dirt course at Belmont. And uh, there was a minor upset as Catholic Boy could only manage to finish second. And Preservationist in his stakes debut uh, made quite a splash and uh, was really dominant in this race. He was. Uh, he just ran away from him in the stretch. He got a nice 127 time form U.S. speed figure, which is, a, I'd say, a borderline grade one number. Uh, you know, he did it easily. There, there was no um, trips you can really talk about. I mean, he sat right there off a of Catholic boy who had the lead to himself and, and was able to run him down and, and run away from him. I thought it was a really good effort. Uh, he was a horse I thought looked good coming in. But uh, it'll sound kind of funny. I, I considered betting him, and I looked at the odds board. And to me, I think at the time he was six to one. And I said to myself, ah, that's just not quite enough for me. So I'm going to pass. And then it turned out he really got hammered late down to seven to two uh, and, and proved every, every bit of, uh, worth every penny of that. Yeah, I'd actually made it my highlight horse on this card. He's a horse that I'd always liked a little bit. Uh, he's six years old now. I believe this was just his eighth career start. So he's obviously had some issues. I believe he's had some feet problems, Jimmy Jerkins was saying, which is what kept him off the track for so long. He's kind of a bigger, heavier horse. And I know sometimes it's hard to keep those horses' feet in good shape. Um, but he had always shown a ton of ability. Uh, he had the pedigree to go the mile and a quarter distance. But just because he's had so many stops and starts, they never really got that opportunity to stretch him out to these longer distances. And boy, he really relished it. Uh, they want a steady pace throughout. Uh, it wasn't a slow pace. It was moderate. Uh, they just kind of kept throwing down those 12 second, eighth of a mile fractions. But he really finished up strongly. I mean, for him to come home his final quarter and uh, what was it, like 24.3 seconds, that's really strong for the end of a dirt race going this distance. And uh, I'll be interested to see where he goes from here, if they can keep him on the track, keep him sound. Uh, he's so lightly raced, I don't see why he couldn't take another step forward as he moves up to actual grade one company. I think that we're talking about possibly going to the Woodward next. Uh, I just think he's a really exciting horse that's uh, lightly raced and uh, he might have some more upside. As for Catholic Boy, personally, I thought he was kind of overbet in this race, especially a few minutes to post when you were saying Preservationist was six to one. I believe Catholic Boy was like three to five or four to five uh, going into the gate. Uh, he drifted up to six to five late. The thing with Catholic Boy is, based on speed figures, and we had talked about this previously, he's just not really faster than the other horses. And I think people were building him up to be better than he was because it's just kind of cool that he can run on dirt and turf. Is he really a grade one horse on either surface? I'm not sure. He ran fine in this race. Uh, what did you think of his trip? I, I was going to say the same thing. He's a horse that just never really run a particularly fast race. So I think the, the reputation kind of exceeds what's what we've actually shown on the track. And I definitely thought he was over betting here. Uh, I had to uh, really restrain myself not to bet Pavel. He's a horse I, I seem to always get sucked into, but I, I held back this time. I just wound up watching this one, but uh, I totally agree with you on Catholic boy. Uh, I'm not sure which surface he's better on at this point. I, I'd probably point him to turf where he has been a grade one winner, I think as a three-year-old and, and maybe he's got a little more upside there because I just don't see him beating top horses running these kind of races, uh, especially when you get to 10 furlongs. Uh, I, I'd rather see him on turf where maybe there's a little more upside than we saw here. 
Yeah, I know Jonathan Thomas sounded a little bit upset with the ride afterwards that he kind of made that early backstretch move. I don't think being on the lead was a bad place to be in this race because they were going such a moderate clip up front. If he had been sitting second off Preservationist, I doubt the result would have been different. Uh, but I agree with you. I just think he's a horse that... I guess they could try him on turf again. Maybe more distance is the key to him because he really does seem to have that grinding style and plenty of stamina. I'm um, just not really sure where he fits. Uh, I think their, their goal now is the Woodward next. Uh, I'm not sure turning back to nine furlongs is really what he wants to do on the dirt, but we'll find out. Uh, both of these horses moving forward uh, are exciting, but I think preservation is, is the one that I would want. Yeah, uh, and has a Catholic boys never had too much problem winning on the lead on the turf, if I remember right. Even uh, dug back in and came back on a few times. So I, I was a little baffled by those comments, Pro probably just looking for an excuse. Uh, the horse ran well, but just, just not good enough. Yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, the two grade one races on the card on Saturday were both on the turf for the Phillies and the Colts, uh, three-year-olds each. Uh, we'll start with the Belmont Derby for the Colts, uh, was one of, which was run as the ninth race. Uh, Henley's Joy, uh, a horse who had been somewhat unlucky in some of his prior races, had had some trips, uh, but he had been beaten by a lot of common rivals in this race many times before. He turned the tables on all of them. I think the trips had a lot to do with the results of this race, though. Yeah, I do as well. I, I I think if you ran this race 10 times, you might get five or six different winners. Uh, you'd probably only get one horse win it a couple times, but he got the trip in here. Uh, like you said, he turned the tables on some rivals. I, I couldn't come up with him before the race. Uh, he did have some trips, but not enough that I was willing to back him. Uh, but, you know, good effort, good effort from him. Social paranoia ran well. He's a horse we've talked about a few times on the podcast. And uh, I was impressed with Rock Emperor, who ran first time for Chad Brown from the 14 post. Kind of came from way out of it to get third, where the, the top two had a, a much bigger head start on him in here. So, you know, solid race. Uh, nothing I'm going to get too excited about. I think as one Catholic boy won last year, I thought he, he was uh, a more exciting horse than these, if that says anything about it. Yeah, I mean, it was a competitive race. It was a great wagering race if you uh, had a good opinion. It was a fun race to handicap for sure because there were so many trips to analyze going in and so many horses with common form lines. Uh, I, I couldn't make Henley's joy either. I know he had had some tough trips, especially uh, in the Churchill Downs race, the American turf, as well as in uh, the uh, Pennine Ridge, the prep for this. He had been a little wide on each occasion. Uh, but this time, he wasn't wide. Uh, he actually broke on top. And I thought Jose Lascano really did a good job to not grab him when he broke so sharply. Cause I feel like a lot of riders that are, that ride horses that typically come from off the pace. If a horse breaks on top, they just feel like they have to drag them to the back of the pack. And Jose Lascano didn't do that. He allowed him to, to go forward. Henley's door was actually leading the field past the wire the first time. And he got him back to sit about third on the rail for this entire trip, just saved a ton of ground, got off the rail as soon as they straightened away in the stretch. And he was able to get the jump on some other horses who were running on late. I just thought Jose Lascano gave, uh, one of the best rides of the meet. And I think this actually did turn out to be his final win of, of this Belmont Park meet. And it won him the riding title. And I think that was pretty fitting because he really deserved it. Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good point about the ride. So many times we see guys snatch up uh, horses that come from off the pace and break well. When normally, I mean, they're going to drop back a little bit anyway and get the position they prefer and maybe even a little more advantageous position. Uh, especially in cases like this where when you do break well, it means some others probably didn't if you have a closer on top, and there's no need to give up that advantage. So great ride and a, a well-deserved riding title for Liz Cano. Yeah, I do just want to mention the, the, the uh, trips and performances of a couple of the Trad Brown runners, uh, Rock Emperor and Digital Age. I thought Rock Emperor actually ran really well because uh, John Velasquez gave him the good ride too. He took him to the back of the pack and just kind of stayed there for the entire race, which it's not a bad place to be when you're in such a crowded field with the potential for a lot of traffic trouble. He was kind of removed from that for the first uh, seven furlongs of the race. Rock Emperor passed about 10 horses in the stretch. It was really running on late. I know the pace figures are color-coded red, but I think that's because we see a lot of slow paces in these mile-and-a-quarter races. I, I thought the pace was pretty much on the moderate side. It's not like it was just falling apart at the end because the top two had been close to the pace throughout. Uh, Rock Emperor, this was his first start in the U.S., and I imagine he'll stay with Chad Brown uh, in this country for uh, the remainder of his three-year-old season. Uh, he seems like a, an exciting horse moving forward in this series. 
He does. Uh, it's funny you mentioned Chad Brown. Uh, we had several turf stakes, and, and he actually got shut out this weekend, though he did win one of the dirt stakes. Uh, obviously, you can't wager on something like that, but I imagine if you could, it would have paid a nice price. Yeah, no, that's true. That is kind of surprising. He had uh, some horses that took a lot of support in a lot of these races, and they just didn't quite perform, uh, including Digital Age. I don't think he was actually the favorite. I believe Seismic Wave was the favorite. Uh, I think Digital Age was the second choice. Digital Age ran fine. I, I feel like the final eighth of a mile kind of caught up to him a little bit. He's a horse that had questionable pedigree to get a mile and a quarter, and uh, he just flattened out after seeming to make a good move from about the quarter pole to the eighth pole. He just couldn't quite carry that momentum forward. Uh, all these horses are so evenly matched, though, if we see different trips next time out in the Saratoga Derby, uh, which is coming up in about four weeks, uh, I'm not going to be surprised if we see a different result. No, uh, and I'll actually be there for that one. So hopefully I'll see you see you for that. I'm looking forward to those. Those are going to be interesting, the, uh, the Oaks and the Derby that they're running this year. Uh, new races, and I think they're well warranted with the um, so many more turf races being run these days. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely have to get together that weekend. That should be. I think they're running them on Friday and Sunday. I want to say around the Whitney. That should that should be a fun weekend. Um, moving on to the Philly version of the race, the Belmont Oaks. Uh, a bit more of a decisive result here as Concrete Rose. I think really asserted herself as the leader of this division now as a three-year-old. Uh, newspaper of record had been the dominant and undisputed leader of this division when they were two-year-olds, but Concrete Rose has really taken a step forward. Uh, she hinted that might be the case in the Edgewood last time, and I think she left no doubt that she's just to cut above these after the Belmont Oaks. She did, and I should mention, I didn't mention, the winner of the Derby got a 115 time form U.S. speed figure, and that's what I wound up settling on for the Oaks winner as well, Concrete Rose, that same 115. And if people look at the final times, uh, they're probably going to be scratching their heads a bit, but I know we've talked about it before on turf. You just can't really use final time as a reliable indicator of how good these horses were. Uh, if I went strictly based on final time, the uh, the Derby would have been a good three or four points higher. The, the Oaks probably would have been seven or eight points lower. And I, I just don't think there's any way you could watch this race and think that Concrete Rose regressed three or four lengths winning. Uh, she was very impressive. It was just strictly a matter of pace. Whereas, as you mentioned, we get a lot of slow paces in these mile and a quarter races. I think that's what we got in the Oaks. Whereas the, the Derby, we got a much more stout pace. Um, I'll talk about uh, fast paced turf races another time. I, I could go on for 20 minutes about that, but, but, but we talk about how uh, slow paces underrate the, the horses a bit sometimes as far as what time they can run in the same vein, the uh, faster paces can kind of overrate it. Cause on the turf, these horses are really never going as fast as they really could. Uh, the, the paces are always, the races are always more tactical. So in this case, I think it was a combination of both and, and I really think the 115s that, that we gave both races kind of tell you uh, are really reasonable estimates of how good these horses are. And just to expand upon that, I think what you were saying about fast paces, exaggerating performances is really pronounced when you get these hard, firm turf courses like what we've had at Belmont in recent weeks. Uh, we'll get to the Manila in a second, but I mean, we saw some three-year-olds going a mile in that race after setting an honest pace that nearly are breaking the track record. Uh, and that's because uh, horses that go start out going fast on these harder turf courses, they're able to sustain that momentum better than other horses might be able to on more demanding courses. It just seems like uh, their speed is not as drained by the end of the race as it might be otherwise. And we saw that in the Belmont Derby as well. And I mean, in this Belmont Oaks, they went to the six furlong fraction, a full two and a half seconds slower than the Colts did uh, just two races later. And it would just be impossible for these Phillies to come home fast enough to catch up to that uh, deficit that had been left uh, if they'd been running in the same race as the Colts. I mean, they'd be trailing that field by about 15 lengths. And you just can't make up that kind of uh, ground in the final three-eighths or, or half mile. So, I mean, these Phillies really did come home quite fast, uh, but I think it was the right decision to uh, kind of break these races out and treat them as, as separate situations, even though they were run just two races apart. Um, Concrete Rose, yeah, she's just a really nice filly. I do want to touch upon the tactics on newspaper of record and just what's going on with her. Cause I saw a lot of people after the race, uh, really knocking Irad Ortiz for the ride as if it was all his fault. And 
you have to read the pre-race quotes where uh, Dave Gretting and others reported that uh, the, the tactics that Chad Brown had settled upon with her and the owners were to rate her at this time and just to see if it worked out. Uh, it was a risk, an experiment, and obviously it failed. Uh, they're not going to ride her that way ever again, I would assume. Uh, but uh, Sometimes these things happen. She's just a filly that's unrateable. Uh, once in a while, we get a horse like this, we'll get behind other horses, and they will settle. It just turns out that newspaper record is not that horse. No, that that was pretty ugly, really. I haven't went back and watched the replay, but I'm sure some horses had to have been affected by by her as she just you know was totally rank and veered out and kind of cut to the outside. It was really an ugly performance. I think she wound up finishing last. Uh, you know, we've obviously talked about her several times and, you know, I've said it over and over again. Oh, yeah, I think she's just worth going against it until we see see her get back to that form. But I'm not sure it's coming to that two year old form. Yeah, my my outlook on her or has has evolved a little bit over time. She's obviously a runoff type. Uh, they really can't rate her. She's just got a ton of speed and that's the way she's going to she needs to be ridden. They need to just let her go. Um, she probably wants less distance. I think a mile and a quarter is just too far for her. She really has, uh, hold on a sec. We'll pick up in a sec. I've got a delivery. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, I'll take over while you're gone for a minute. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, trying to rate her at a mile and a quarter was probably a, a little bit of a silly decision because she is a horse who, who's proven to have high tactical speed and, and the pace is always going to be slower going a mile and a quarter. So not only are you trying to put her behind horses, you're trying to put her behind horses in a race where she's going to be running slower than she ever has before. So, I mean, I don't blame them for trying something. She had lost her first, first couple efforts, but you know, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me in here and ultimately proved a little dangerous because of the horse, not, not blaming. I read, uh, she just wouldn't take to the rating and, and, you know, I'm curious where they go from her. It seems like maybe a mile's about her limit at this point against top horses. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, my uh, housemate was getting his blue apron delivery this week. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, newspaper records. She actually did affect uh, Coral Beach, the long shot for Aiden O'Brien, who was badly steadied when when newspaper record was just veering out on the back stretch, and Irad Ortiz couldn't control her. And, and to those who are kind of um, uh, critiquing Irad for taking her so far back. It's a kind of situation where if he had let go of the reins and just dropped her and gave her her head, she could have run up on heels and really made a dangerous situation, not just for the other riders, but even for him, because uh, a horse can clip heels in that situation. So you do just want to protect yourself and the horse when you have a, uh, a runner that's so uncontrollable underneath you. Um, what I was trying to say before about newspaper of record is that she probably does want less distance. She's kind of a smaller filly that doesn't seem like she's really developed in stature since her juvenile season. And I hope they try to turn her into more of a miler with speed. I think that's the way to go with her moving forward. And I assume Chad Brown will figure that out uh, as well and, and carve out a path for her because it would be a shame if they just retired her because she does have real talent and real speed. I think that they just have to figure out how to get it out of her. Yeah, I agree. I'd like to see him just let her go one of these times. We, we've we seen milers in the past who, who just go as fast as they can, as far as they can, and be really successful. And, you know, before I gave up on her, I'd really just like to see that tactic. Just let her run and, and see if they can catch her, because oftentimes you'll just sap the kick of all the closers in those spots and, you know, maybe be able to hang on. Speaking of letting horses run, a horse that often gets to do that out of the front end is Promises Fulfilled. And we saw him strut his stuff in the John A. Nehru, uh, which was previously the Belmont Sprint Championship. Uh, this uh, seven furlong race, he was dropping down to grade two company after facing some tougher grade one foes in recent starts. And it just seemed like the drop in class really worked for this horse. And the fact that he got to set a slow pace didn't hurt either. Yeah, it sure didn't. We had this project uh, predicted in the pace projector. It's pretty obvious he was lone speed. Uh, Killy Beggs captain, I believe, broke poorly. Uh, maybe he was one who could have challenged him early, but he just drew off and ran away from the field. I I'm not sure that Killy Beggs captain could have really uh, given him a whole lot of a fight in here. Uh, even if he did break well, he'd have been trying to press him. And we know promises fulfilled can go a lot faster than he did here. 
Uh, he got a 123 time form U.S. speed figure. Uh, the final time was 128. So we knocked it back because of that slow pace. But he's a horse who's hit 130 before. Uh, his last couple races have been in the 127, 129 range. So he's a horse that clearly can go faster. He he was just much better than the horses he faced in here. And I'm sure I think he would have ran as fast as he needed to to win. Yeah, this is a classic example of some people getting way too focused on the results of races in knocking him because I've seen some people say he's not the same horse that he was as a three-year-old or I think he's actually better than he was as a three-year-old because I know he's been losing some of these races, but he's involved in one of the toughest divisions in the country, the horses like Mitoli out there, uh, as well as some others. Uh, these uh, sprint, older sprint division races are really tough these days and uh, promises fulfilled. Uh, he's running fast speed figures, probably faster than he did as a three-year-old. And I just think he's in great form right now. Six to seven furlongs is really what he wants to do. The Met Mile was a little ambitious to think he could get the mile against those top horses like that. But um, I'll be interested to see if he faces Matoli again in the future because Matoli probably is the better horse. But I don't think there's as big of a gap between promises fulfilled and the top horses in this division as some people think. No, I don't either. I, another one you didn't mention, World of Trouble, who's run on turf a few times here, but certainly could move back to dirt as he's shown and run fast. But, yeah, I mean, I th he's definitely one of the top sprinters out there. I mean, he led the Breeders' Cup sprint through a half mile, I believe it was, last year uh, as a three-year-old. So he, he's a very fast horse, and that speed's always dangerous. Uh, if you let him go, he, he's going to be hard to run down. He's gotten into some pace battles the last couple times out, and – represented himself well i mean he didn't win but he certainly didn't run disgraceful and i think he's one of the top sprinters out there i totally agree with that sticking with the one turn races for the final stakes race on saturday's card at belmont uh actually was the first one that was run during the day was the grade three dwyer for the three-year-olds going a mile and uh code of honor Another one of these three-year-olds that seems to really be thriving after the Triple Crown grind is over. Uh, he ran in the Kentucky Derby and then skipped the other two races. Uh, I thought he actually ran quite well in the Kentucky Derby. He got a good trip, but he outran my expectations. And uh, getting back to the one-turn mile in this Dwyer, it seemed to really suit him. Uh, I, I never thought he was in a great spot, kind of far back in an awkward position behind a slow pace. But once he got into the stretch, he just asserted his class. He did. And I mean, when you say a slow pace, it was a very slow pace. We have all, all the fractions coded in blue and it just didn't matter to him. I mean, he was, you know, well back, well off the pace and, and just blew by everybody in here. Uh, granted, you know, it wasn't the strongest competition, but he, he ran a 119, which was a point faster than his uh, runner up finish in the Derby. Um so just a good effort. He's just another one of these solid three-year-olds. Uh, I know this crop, crop gets knocked a lot on social media and very even on watching uh, some of the races on TV. But I just we've talked about it before. I really don't think it's a bad crop. I think it's a, a deep, strong crop. And just to give an example, a Catholic boy who we talked about earlier is a horse who went off, you know, six to five against older horses. He's basically a 120, 122 type horse on our speed figures. And we've seen the three-year-olds are able to run very similar races to his already, and, and they're only going to get better. So I'm actually looking forward to, to seeing these horses develop. I see where Code of Honor goes next. He's a horse who, you know, I don't even know that a mile and a quarter like he ran in the Derby is his best distance. He may be better suited to these shorter races. And that finishing kick was really something on Saturday. Yeah, they're not going to do it, but I would love to see him kind of reverse course and turn back to a race like the Allen Jerkins because he's got such a turn of foot and the powerful finishing kick uh, in these shorter races uh, that's a little bit less effective in the longer races, stretching out to a mile and a quarter. I get it, though, that they've got to point to a race like the Travers. It's the premier race for the three-year-olds. He was second in the Kentucky Derby, uh, uh, elevated from third. So it makes sense to run in a race like the Travers because that's where he deserves to be. Uh, but uh, in the future, once we get past these races that Shug kind of has to point him to, I'd be interested if he's a more versatile horse than uh, just running in those classic distance races because I really think he can go shorter as well. Um, as for the others in here, final Jeopardy ran fine. I thought Ro Waiton was a little bit unlucky. He probably should have been second. He just got uh, stuck on the rail for a little too long uh, behind that pace and had to alter course in the stretch. But, I mean, let's be honest, nobody was getting the code of honor in this race. 
No, they weren't. I agree about Roe Eaton. I, that was a little bit baffling ride to me. There was no pace in the race, and he still kind of got dragged back on the rail and stuck behind horses. But he, he probably was second best in here and should have run second. But, you know, I, I, I get it. He kind of came from off the pieces last time out. He sat behind horses and got through. But I just hate when these guys take take away a horse's best asset, which in his case is speed. And they certainly did it here. So he's one I'd expect to run a little bit better next time. But I still don't think he was beating Code of Honor. Sticking with the three-year-olds, we're going to turn it back to Thursday at Belmont Park and kind of chronologically go through the stakes races for the rest of the week. Uh, um, Thursday's feature was the Manila for the three-year-olds on the turf. And speaking of horses coming out of some of the Triple Crown prep races and the Triple Crown races, uh, we saw Win Win Win, uh, who had, I believe, run in the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. Uh, he switched to turf in this race for the first time. He's a horse that I think the connections have always had turf in the back of their mind because he's a son of Hattrick. Uh, and he really does have more of a Turk pedigree. And uh, he ran to that pedigree in this race. I guess it shouldn't have been a big surprise. He went off at four to one. Uh, and uh, he just went from last to first, ran them down, got more pace uh, to run into than I think most of us expected he would. Uh, but he still ran a fine race in his first start on the turf. He did. This race surprised me a bit. I, I honestly, when I saw the entries, I, I figured he would get bet a lot more heavier than he did. And, and I had plans to bet against him. But but the way the odds turned out, I wound up betting on him. It just kind of threw me off there and got a little bit lucky here. I, I would argue that Fog of War probably ran a little bit better race being up closer to the pace. Uh, he actually got a 117 speed figure from us compared to the 116 that win, win, win got. But that 116 is a good number for three-year-olds. We saw the Belmont Derby was one with a 115. Uh, we haven't had a lot of three-year-old turfers hitting the 120 mark, if any, that I can remember. So, you know, he's right up there. I, I kind of thought maybe he would be better as a dirt sprinter, but they took a shot on turf. And with the purses these days, may maybe that'll turn out to be a good decision. Time will tell soon. Yeah, uh, I think they're going to stick on turf for now. Uh, they haven't really announced a plan yet. Uh, I personally think with this horse, the shorter distances really make the difference. Uh, getting back to the one-turn mile in this race, I think it really intensified his late kick that had not been quite as pronounced in some of the longer races we had seen him in on the dirt. He had been so effective going shorter early in his career, and I think uh, going shorter really makes the difference for him regardless of surface. Uh, but we'll see what they do if they choose a race like the Allen Jerkins or if they stretch him out to a race like uh, like the Saratoga Derby and take on the Belmont Derby horses. We'll see. I, I guess they have some options with him. But like you were saying, that's a respectable speed figure, and uh, I see no reason why he can't compete against those turf horses or dirt horses moving forward at that, that grade one level. Yeah, and what did you think of Fog of War? I mean, I was his last race was so bad in my eyes, I, I just couldn't bring myself to like him. But I, I thought he ran really well in here. Yeah, I think we just assume sometimes that Chad Brown's always going to have these horses ready to go off these long layoffs. And it's not always the case. It's the case quite often because he does have very good statistics doing that. But it just seemed like Fog of War was a little rusty last time. And I was certainly skeptical of him in this spot, especially as the favorite, which I think he did uh, end up going off as the favorite, uh, lukewarm at three to one. But uh, he ran much better than he ever had before. He really took a step forward, second off the layoff, handled the one mile of distance as he had as a two-year-old. And uh, like you were saying, the pace isn't color-coded red as being fast, but I think it was an honest contested pace, the one that certainly turned out to be uh, a lot stronger in the early going than than I expected it to be. I thought pole setter was going to be controlling up front, and he actually had some company and a horse actually outran him to the lead. Uh, but I thought Fog of War held on really well after making that move to the lead at the eighth pole. And uh, he's one that I want to see going no farther than a mile. I think that's really the max for him. But he's just as good as anybody else out there, I think. Yeah, agreed. Um, sticking with the three-year-olds again, I uh, moving back to the dirt on Friday's card. Uh, we saw... Chan Brown didn't win on the turf this weekend, but he did have this dirt victory uh, with Royal Charlotte in the victory ride going six furlongs. Uh, I've got to be honest. I've never been that impressed by this filly. I know she's won uh, now four races in a row, three coming into this. I didn't love any of her races that much, but she really impressed me in this spot because uh, Cookie Dough, I think, really did run her race on the turn back and Royal Charlotte just came and got her. 
Yeah, she she's a horse I hadn't been overly impressed with, despite her, her modest winning streak. But she she proved able to raid off that fast pace. We have all the fractions coated in red and just won easily. I mean, as they were turning into the lane, this race was over. There was no doubt who was winning this one. Uh, she was the only one who, who was making any kind of move. Cookie Dough held on for second after getting into a – a pretty good battle early with Brill, who dropped out and, and ran back. She was a bit disappointing for me. I thought she'd run better around the one turn, but I think it was a pretty strong race. The winner got a 116. Uh, Cookie Dough got a 118 uh, for setting that fast pace. She gets a little bit of a bonus, which, you know, depending on the race, I, I'm not sure I'd put a whole lot of stock in that. I, I think Royal Charlotte was, was the better horse despite the pace here, and you know, she's a horse who, who looks like she could probably go seven furlongs, maybe, maybe even a mile. So, you know, I'm curious to see where she goes. Uh, she surprised me from here, and you got to sometimes reverse course on your horse so they don't cost it too much money. Yeah, the one caveat in this race is that the horse that was supposed to be Royal Charlotte's main competition, Sue's Fortune, something just went wrong with her. Uh, she was vanned off after the race and pulled up. Uh, reportedly, she's she's – has no major injury and she's okay. I think Jeremiah Engelhardt tweeted that after the race, uh, but uh, just disappointing that she couldn't uh, move forward and build upon her impressive uh, second place finish to break even in her prior start. So that made the race a little bit easier, but Royal Charlotte still ran a really fine speed figure for a three-year-old filly. And uh, as you were saying, moving on to race like the prior is in the test, she's going to be really tough. Uh, I have no knocks against her at this point. Yeah, it's a strong division. Uh, she's jumping in with Kofefi, who we we saw lose last time, but against older horses and break even. Uh, there's some real runners in the three-year-old Philly sprint division. Now, the other stakes race on Friday at Belmont Park was the River Memories going a mile and a half on the turf for Phillies and Mares. Uh, originally, when this race was drawn, it seemed really strong, but uh, about half of the field was also cross-entered in the Robert G. Dick at uh, Delaware Park on Saturday and about half of them did end up scratching out to run in that spot instead, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, so this was just a field of six after 12 were entered, and Semper Sententiae just caught the right field. She had been facing much better horses in her prior starts against graded stakes company, and this drop down to a listed stakes race just did the trick. Yeah, it did. Uh, she got a 118 time form U.S. speed figure for the win. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about this one. Uh, you might note there in our PPs, there's no uh, pace figures for this race. And that's just because on this course, they, they just haven't run this distance often enough to, to have any confidence in making speed figures. But to my eye, it looked like a relatively honest pace. I don't think it was overly fast or overly slow. So I think we can take the results at face value. The top two were the best two horses in here. I feel the same way. Semper Sententia is a horse that actually coming into this race was still eligible for a nominator's one allowance race because she had only earned her maiden victory. And even though she had placed in a bunch of graded stakes races and they keep running her in these stakes races that I think she uh, rewarded her connections that she got a well-deserved win here. Uh, but I agree. These aren't the toughest. Uh, this wasn't the toughest field out there. And I think if she moves back up in class in the future, she might uh, get no more than a minor award again. Uh, on Sunday at Belmont Park, the final stakes race of this past weekend was the state dinner uh, for the older horse who's going a mile and a 16th on the dirt. And a uh, bit of a surprising result as Prince Lucky, who seemed to have gone off form after uh, running such impressive races over the winter at Gulfstream. Uh, he didn't run well in the Westchester as the favorite, then really disappointed. I think he was last in the Met Mile, but he got back on track in the state dinner. Uh, I think the more aggressive tactics really paid off for him. And it also helped that horses like Backyard Heaven and uh, Sunny Ridge just didn't really show up. Yeah, I thought it was a good effort by Prince Lucky. Uh, I would argue it, from a speed figure perspective, you could almost put a line through his last three. It's just not representative. Uh, one was over a sloppy track that he didn't seem to handle. One was against Matoli. And the one at Gulfstream came in a win in what was basically a paid workout where he did no running at all for the first three quarters of a mile and, and just finished strong so he couldn't get a, a good figure that day. So he kind of got back to that. He ran a 119 here. Uh, his, his big race at Gulfstream, I think he had run in the mid-120s. But it, it was an impressive effort. Uh, Candy Graham ran okay as the even money favorite. Uh, I thought Backyard Heaven, the, the tote board, told the story with him. Uh, he went off 7-2. to two, And if you thought he was going to run back to his best races, he was clearly the best horse in here. So he was definitely a bit dead on the board, in my opinion. So I kind of ignored him. 
Yeah, I totally misread this race. Uh, I actually thought Candy Graham was an interesting horse to pick. Never in my wildest dreams did I think he'd be even money uh, off just a couple of allowance wins against the field of this quality. But as you were saying, backyard heaven, I think the word was out that he just wasn't really ready off the layoff or just wasn't quite the same horse. And Prince Lucky was also pretty dead on the board. I think a lot of people were were just off his bandwagon after those two poor performances. But as you were saying, he did have some excuses. And he got back on track here. I still don't think he's the kind of horse that we thought he might be going back over the winter when he ran. I believe he got a 127 in that, uh, I want to say, was the Howl's Hope. Uh, but uh, he's still capable of running some decent speed figures when he gets the right kind of setup as he did in this race. I'm just not sure he's that kind of grade one, grade two type of horse that some of us wanted him to be. No, I agree. A 119 is a grade three type figure for older horses. And, you know, looking at the field, uh, assuming backyard heaven is not the horse he once was, that's basically what this race was, a grade three. And he proved the best in the field. And, you know, I, I'd be against him if he stepped back up in class. Uh, I'd expect more of a reversion to what we saw in the Met Mile. Uh, but, you know, good effort. Uh, if he spotted right, he, he's going to give a good effort. Uh, I do want to mention a couple of other non-stakes races from this past week at Belmont, uh, starting with uh, a Wednesday allowance race that featured the return of Luke Cullen, uh, who earned a 119 time form U.S. speed figure for this return, uh, going a mile and 16th on the turf. Uh, Luke Cullen's a horse that I think a lot of people probably forgot about, but he had been a really nice three-year-old. He had finished behind horses like uh, Bricks and Mortar and Yoshida in the uh, stakes race uh, in the fall. I believe that was the... Uh, Hill Prince he came back in the second or third to Robert Bruce in a stakes. Uh, his only start as a four year old and uh, coming off a layoff of well over a year in this allowance race. I thought he put forth a nice effort and I'm not going to be shocked if he moves back up into graded stakes company and does quite well in the future. Yeah, I thought it was a good effort as well. He got, as you say, he got a 119 speed figure for the effort. And what I liked, he was able to, it was a very slow pace. We have all the fractions coded in red. Uh, Noble Indy, uh, three-year-old last year who was on the Derby. I think he even ran in the Derby. Um, you know, said it, I think. Um, and he was able to run him down. Therapist ran third, who was sitting second all the way around. So, you know, the pace was definitely a little bit against them sitting in third, and he was able to run past those. Uh, I think he was much the best horse in here. Uh, the only other one I'd be interested in, not so much interested in, but I'd be willing to put a line through force to pass uh, as this was just a bit of a merry-go-round race. He's the one who really had no chance in here given his running style. But good effort from the winner, and I would expect them to move back up in the stakes. And He's run well into the 120s before, so he could certainly be competitive. Uh, it was a good, I think it was more than a year layoff here, so certainly a good effort off the bench. Yeah, I agree. I know it was just an allowance race or an optional claiming race, but it really did have a stakes feel to it with horses like Force the Past and Therapist in here. And uh, I like Luke Cullen. I like this effort. He was even a little bit green in the stretch, not totally focused. And I think Kieran McLaughlin can get him to move forward off this performance as long as he stays sound. Uh, so he's a horse that I would look for in stakes like, I don't know if the Four Star Dave is too tough, but uh, races like the Bernard Baruch perhaps uh, later in the summer at Saratoga. Uh, the one other race I want to discuss from this week at Belmont was a two-year-old maiden race on Thursday where Greenlight Go won his debut for Jimmy Jerkins. Uh, this horse was out of the very fast dam, Light Green, who I believe had run a really fast race in, I want to say, the Prioress a number of years ago. Uh, I liked what I saw from this horse. I know the pace wasn't that fast, but he, he won this race uh, pretty easily. Yeah, I agree. And I just one comment I want to make about that with these two year olds. I mean, the way our algorithm set up, we do punish horses for for setting slow paces. But with two year olds, I actually like to see this kind of race shape because it tells me these horses can rate a bit and that they're going to be able to go longer when they stretch out. Uh, the horses you really want to be against are the ones that that set fast paces and kind of hang on because they're not going to get to run five and five and a half furlongs. They're going to be stretching out the six and seven. So I really do like to see this kind of running, running shit, you know, uh, line through these horses. Uh, I'd rather see the blue than the red. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And it's something that I was thinking about a lot when I was handicapping the Schuylerville uh, an opening day tomorrow at Saratoga. Uh, you see those two different types of horses, those that go out and set some really fast fractions and hold on going four and a half furlongs, as opposed to those that kind of go slower early and, 
and finish up strongly but get lower speed figures, I think those horses might be closer in ability than the speed figures indicate. And that's the, that, that's what's so tough about making uh, speed figures for two-year-old races is uh, they're so short and they're so dependent on the early pace. Uh, but Green Light Go, uh, he, this horse looked like a three-year-old among two-year-olds. I mean, just watching the race from a physical standpoint, he just towered over his foes. And I don't think uh, Junior Alvarado, who was riding, ever even took out his stick. Uh, he rode this horse. Uh, he gave him a hand ride to the ro- to the wire. Uh, I was just really impressed with what I saw from him, and I would imagine it's going to be on to Stakes Company for this horse in the future. Just a nice debut. Yeah, and one one note about him, he didn't use Lasix either, which is something that's fairly rare these days. Uh, You see it a little bit more these days with two-year-olds, but I would imagine he'll get it eventually, and it never really hurts. uh, So, yeah, I expect a lot of good things from this horse. I, I was really impressed with him. Well, I think that's fitting that we bookend our, the two races at Belmont with two Jimmy Jerkins horses, one who finally was reaching his peak as a 60-year-old and now a two-year-old who was uh, impressive in his debut, but starting without Lasix and probably has a, a forward move in him or two moving forward. Uh, we'll move on to Delaware Park, and we'll talk about four of the stakes races from their Saturday card. Uh, I don't know if it was considered the feature race, but certainly the race that uh, attracted the most attention at Delaware Park on Saturday was the Delaware Oaks which featured last year's two-year-old champion, Jaywalk. Uh, Jaywalk has had a rough go of it so far as a three-year-old. Uh, she disappointed in her, de- her three-year-old debut as the odds-on favorite, uh, with really not a factor in the Kentucky Oaks. It was nice to see her get back on track here. Uh, I don't know if it was the return to Delaware or the fact that uh, they added blinkers for the first time, but she just looked like her old, old self, and she drew off in this race really impressively and earned a fast speed figure. Yeah, she got a 122 for the effort, which is it's huge for a three-year-old filly. It's a, as good as we've seen uh, no, anything else not named Garana, I believe. Uh, so it, it was a big effort. It, this was basically a match race on paper, and that's how it played out on the track. But Fashion Faux Pas is no slash, uh, slouch. She, she is a good filly. Uh, she tried to take it to Jaywalk, tried to keep up with her, and just couldn't do it. And you know, Jaywalk ran away from her through the stretch. So I, I don't think it's a stretch at all to say she's back in, in top form. Um, you know, it's hard to say with these who she's going to run up against. She's a horse that clearly seems to need to be on the lead. So if she runs again up against a horse like uh, Serengeti Empress, I believe, is that her? Is it Express or Empress? I'm drawing it. Empress. Empress, yeah. Uh, you know, things could get tough, but but she certainly is da- very dangerous when she makes the lead. And I think the blinkers helped her do that here. And I'm sure she'll keep them on uh, and really looking forward to seeing where she shows up and particularly who she's in against. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I guess they'll point to races at Saratoga, like the coaching club American Oaks, perhaps that might be able to back a little bit soon. I'm not sure. Um And uh, the Alabama maybe is a more likely target. Uh, I would imagine they'll also point to a race like the Cotillion at Parks later in the year. But uh, based on this performance, she has every right to be in those races and to be considered a strong contender. Because as you were saying, we saw that big number out of Guarana. But aside from her, uh, this is one of the fastest races that we've seen. And Jaywalk just did seem to be a lot more focused with the blinkers. Uh, that that stride that she has, that like long loping stride that we saw out of her in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies, it seemed like she had gotten that action back in this race. Maybe she just loves the Delaware Park course. Uh, but uh, I just loved what I saw from her in this race. And Fashion Faux Pas, as you were saying, she was actually the kind of the surprising four to five favorite in this race off that big win in her prior start. Uh, she didn't run badly at all. She just ran into a filly that frankly, ran out of her skin. And uh, I've always been a fan of Jaywalk. I would love to see her continue to do well. And I'm just excited to see where she goes next. Yeah, Uh, totally agree. Uh, I look forward to it. We know she's going to be a pace presence, I think, anywhere she shows up. And that's always a welcome sight. For sure. Uh, There were a bunch of stakes, uh, turf stakes races on uh, the car on Saturday at Delaware Park. And the biggest of them was probably the Robert G. Dick, uh, which went as the race after the Delaware Oaks. Uh, the favorite in this race was Gaining, who had been entered also in the River Memories at Belmont, and she was one of many who scratched out of this race and instead chose to run the Robert G. Dick. Um, Gaining just probably has been a little overrated. This was her third loss in a row as the favorite, and she actually lost to the same horse that beat her in her prior start at Churchill Downs, Gentle Ruler, who has now won four in a row uh, for Ian Wilkes. And Chris Landeros, I thought, gave her a perfect ride in this race, just saving ground up every step of the way the rail opened up at the top of the stretch and she shot on through she just seems to have really responded well to this stretch out to marathon distances 
Yeah, she did. The betting was really a bit baffling here. Uh, this was one I was actually able to take advantage of. Uh, General Ruler, like you said, she beat gaining last time with, with probably a worse trip from a pace scenario. We had all the, the fractions coded in blue that day, and she was behind gaining, was able to run her down. So I just saw no reason she wasn't going to beat her again, and, and she did so easily. So, you know, sometimes uh, speed figures on turf aren't always the, you know, a hundred percent reliable, but I thought this was a case where clearly she was the better horse coming in and she proved it on the track. Yeah. These horses, I think it just goes to show they can really improve uh, quite suddenly and certain horses can really respond positively to stretching out to longer distances. Some horses just, they might not be able to achieve uh, stakes wins or elite results going a mile and a 16th, a mile and an eighth. But as soon as you stretch them out to a mile and three eighths, a mile and a half, they just turn into completely different horses. And I think Gentle Ruler is uh, a quintessential example of that. Uh, she just is a different kind of horse going these longer distances. And I mean, getting this perfect trip didn't hurt either, but I don't think she was ever in danger of losing this race, uh, given the way the others ran. And uh, we'll see where they go from here. This was not the strongest field, and uh, I'm sure the, the grade one and grade two type races at this level will be a lot tougher and feature some Chad Brown runners, which this race did not. Uh, but she's certainly heading in the right direction for Ian Wilkes. Yeah, I should mention she got a 118 uh, time form U.S. speed figure here. And, you know, you mentioned the trip. She did get a perfect trip. But, you know, she's a kind she showed last time she can sit closer to a slow pace. Uh, the pace was faster here and she dropped further back. So she she appears to not only like the distance, but is pretty versatile from a pace perspective. Now, it wasn't a graded race, but uh, the marathon race on the same card for the male horse is going a mile and a half uh, was the Cape uh, Henlopen Stakes, which went as the fourth race on the card. And we saw Canisar win this race on the turn back. A little funny to say that a horse that's going a mile <laughs> and a half distance is turning back, but he was coming out of the two mile Bel uh, Belmont Gold Cup. He can go two miles, uh, but he can also go a mile and a half. And he was just better than these horses. He was. He wound up going off even money. Uh, this race drew a surprisingly strong field for only a 75000 purse. Uh, we had a lot of horses dropping from graded stakes races. But, you know, he did well. He ran, got a 122, which, you know, as I've mentioned before, that could definitely win a grade three type race, uh, particularly at this distance. He, he's not a horse I'd want to see step up against the big players in the division. But he's certainly a capable horse and, and seems to love these longer distances. Yeah, and we saw Arno Delacour. Uh, he's the trainer of Canisar. He actually finished 1-2 in this race as he also sent out the long shot second place finisher, Surprise Twist. Uh, Surprise Twist actually ran quite well because he probably moved a little bit too soon into what uh, was a fast pace. And Canisar just made that uh, that last move, which is often the right move to make in races going this distance that do feature honest paces up front. But uh, Canisar was just better than these horses, as we were saying. None of, none of the other runners in this race can achieve a speed figure like 122. And uh, he just asserted his dominance. Uh, Arno Delacour did have a pretty strong day on Saturday at Delaware Park because he also won uh, the Grade 3 Kent, which uh, was the co-feature on this card with the Delaware Oaks. Uh, he had Eons, who won this race, getting the better of award winner. And pretty thrilling battle to the wire. Uh, not the strongest group of three-year-olds. And I think this race has really been affected by being run on the same weekend as the Belmont Derby, because you see a lot of the top three-year-olds go in that direction instead. Uh, but Eons is a decent horse. He is. Uh, this is another one. Uh, I guess I probably had my best day at Delaware, because uh, the betting was a little baffling to me here, too, in this one. Uh, he... He had won on Black Eyed Susan Day, a very nice race, and he had come back to win a stake at Delaware with a good 114 speed figure, which was the best in the field. And I was really surprised to get four to one on him. Uh, now, it did, like you said, it was a thrilling finish. Uh, Academy uh, Award winner ran very well to be second, beating just the neck. But but I think Eons was the best horse in here. Uh, he, he was able to chase him down. He was... Uh, you know, on the lead, the majority uh, award winner was on the lead, the majority of the race and, and just a good effort. I mean, these aren't graded stake sources. He got a 112 for the win, as did the runner up. Uh, but, you know, solid three year olds. I say not graded stakes. These aren't grade one type horses, but they certainly can win some stakes if they're spot spotted properly. Yeah, I thought award winner ran quite well, because if you watch the beginning of this race, he was actually a little bit rank in the early going. Uh, he was on the lead, but he looked a little slow to settle. And usually horses like that, uh, when they're pulling uh, on their riders, uh, they don't finish as well as he did. But he really dug in late and battled Eons all the way to the wire. 
Uh, they're both nice horses. Uh, I'll be interested to see where they go from here if they step up to some of the tougher races in New York moving forward, face some of those horses that we saw in the Belmont Derby, because it does feel like the cream of the crop is really running in those grade one type races and not here. Uh, but uh, 112 is a decent number for three-year-olds. It's not that much lower than what we saw in those stakes races at Belmont. So I think these horses are okay. Uh, the final two races that we'll discuss on the podcast this week are at other venues. First, we'll head out to Los Alamitos, where the big race they ran last weekend was the Great Lady M Stakes, uh, going six and a half furlongs on the dirt for the Phillies and Mares. And the heavy favorite in this race was Marley's Freedom, and she just got a great trip, but also looked like a winner every step of the way and uh, just asserted her dominance on the class drop. She did. She got a 116 for the win. I mean, it's solid enough. Not, nothing special. Uh, the the runner up anonymity was coming off a layoff. Uh, she was a narrow. She was barely beaten. I think beaten a neck in the Breeders Cup Philly and Mare Sprint when she finished third. But she did get a great setup that day. So I'm not sure these two are really top fillies. Uh, Bob Baffert seems to spot Marley's freedom well, but she she doesn't run great speed figures. She had a little run where she was running in the 120s, but you know, she's a horse that really needs a, a good setup, and she got it here. Uh, I'm not blown away by this race. She's a horse I'd be against it if she moved into, you know, grade one type races that, that drew some real grade one horses, unlike this one. Yeah, Marley's Freedom's a nice horse. I do think it's probably fair to say that she took advantage of some weaker spots when she earned her big victories last year in a race like like the Bell Arena. I would imagine that race will come up tougher this year because there are just – uh, it seems like there's more depth to the division this year than there was last year, whereas Marley's Freedom was kind of just the, the, the major player and everybody else was kind of uh, on a lower tier. Uh, but she's uh, in races like this, she's going to always be very tough because she can run these speed figures in the high one teens up to 120. And uh, the other horses in, at this grade two or grade three level just can't quite achieve that. Uh, I thought Drayden Van Dyke gave her a great ride on this race, saving ground early, tipping off the rail in the stretch. And uh, she just easily won. I assume it's going to be back up to tougher races from here. I guess we'll see if Baffert runs her at Del Mar or chooses to point to a race like the Ballerina once again. Uh, but uh, I do think with horses like Mia Mischief out there, or potentially even some of the three-year-old sprinters who are running comparable speed figures already, uh, this division could get a lot tougher by the fall. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, a final race we'll talk about on the podcast this week was the Park Stash from Parks in Pennsylvania. And I think this was actually the highest uh, time formula speed figure of the week. Uh, pure sensation. He's just always so dangerous at Parks. I believe he's now six for seven over that turf course there. I think he's actually three for four in this very race. He's won three editions of the Parks stash. And uh, five furlongs, it's his trip. He's never minded a little given the turf course. And he got both of those, those things on Saturday and just put down a huge effort. He did. Like you said, that 128 was the top one that we've talked about. I think it was the top figure of the weekend anywhere. Uh, good effort. Uh, part of the is the track. Uh, he loves parks, as you said. He is 6 of 7, uh, whereas he's 7 of 26 everywhere else, which is, is hardly uh, disgraceful. I mean, he's a really good, tough 8-year-old. But he loves parks, uh, so I, I'm not going to be – overly anxious to bet him if he ships up the saratoga or he's even shipped the del mar in the past to run, run in one of their sprint stakes out of there so though it's a big number and he's done it before at parks he never seems to carry it over to other tracks despite getting bet so good effort he's really a cool horse one of my favorite horses but you know unless he runs at parks again which i think they have a another big sprint coming up uh before the breeders cup kind of a breeders cup turf sprint prep uh i'll be against him uh, in that big number that he got yeah i agree it was kind of a perfect storm for him to want, run one of these gigantic races which we've seen out of him before uh in this park stash he just is able to put up those huge speed figures at parks and not do it other places but I do just want to highlight for a second his career because he's eight years old now and uh, he's just been at the top of the sprint division for so long or right there. I mean, maybe he's a couple of the best at this point in his career, but I mean, he's coming into this race now. He's won four of his last five, so he's still winning races. Uh, just going back to the beginning of, promise, or, uh, of Pure Sensation's career, I mean, he was running against some horses that are sires now, horses like Bayern and Honor Code and, and Corfu in his debut. I mean, it's just cool to see that he's been around for this long and been at this high level of performance for so long. Just a really neat horse. 
Yeah, he is. That's why he's one of my favorites. I mean, he just shows up and gives his best every time. Uh, I love horses that are fast like him and just they go for the lead. Not And he doesn't have to have the lead. He He's come from off the pace to win before, but just a really cool horse. And, and though I said I'll be against him, you know, if he shows up at Saratoga, I will certainly wouldn't be upset if he won. Love seeing horses like this, and, and I hope he sticks around a few more years. I agree with that. Well, those are all the races we'll talk about on the podcast this weekend. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more to talk about in the upcoming weeks with Saratoga getting started this week and Del Mar uh, starting very soon. Uh, so the stakes races will start rolling in, top horses performing all across the country, and we'll talk about all of it in the upcoming weeks. Craig, thanks again, uh, as always, for talking about the races with me this week. As always, you can listen uh, to us on DRF.com. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts. Just subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum and check out the Timeform US Pacecast. Thanks for listening, guys, this week, and we'll be back again next week.